I promised that this day would come and now it's here. We have talked about several proof strategies in the past, direct proof, contrapositive, and proof by contradiction. What should we do when none of these work? As you saw from that highly technical and completely mathematical demonstration, induction is a powerful tool, especially when we are being asked to prove that a proposition holds for all natural numbers. And as we can see, it's also part of a complete breakfast. Jeb. Induction. Induction. The cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. <laughs> Let us consider the example of a bouncing ball that makes inelastic collisions with the ground. Specifically, we will assume that it loses 20% of its energy every time it hits the ground. Let us also assume that it is initially dropped from height h0. Since it loses 20% of its energy with each bounce, each time it comes back up its maximal height will be 80% of its previous height. So after one bounce, it'll rise to 0.8 times the initial height. After two bounces, it should rise to 0.8 times 0.8 times the initial height. If we write the height after the nth bounce to be hn, then we might guess that the height hn is 0.8 to the n power times h0. Can we prove this? Now for a little bit of history and a cute story. First of all, let me introduce you to Gauss. Carl Friedrich Gauss, that is. Gauss lived from 1777 until 1855 and was one of the most important 19th century mathematicians. Some of the most important mathematical results are due to Gauss. The first is the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that any polynomial of degree n with real coefficients can be factored into n linear factors as long as we allow for complex numbers. This is usually stated as every real polynomial of degree n has n complex roots. He also, surprisingly enough, developed the theory of the fast Fourier transform. What's particularly amazing about this is that the FFT is one of the most important algorithms for dealing with digital signals and has only arisen as an application in the digital era. But Gauss developed this more than a century before the first digital computers were built. And of course, we have to mention the Gaussian distribution, which takes a very central role in both statistics and probability. But what I want to talk about today is a story that everyone tells about Gauss and an amazing calculation he did as a child. I can assure you that all of the details of what you're about to see are exactly true. <laughs>
okay, so maybe this story isn't entirely true the way I told it, but this is a story that almost every mathematician is familiar with. The point of this story is not that Gauss, or anyone else for that matter, can add a bunch of numbers really quickly in their head. That wouldn't even be that interesting. The interesting part of this story is that Gauss saw a way to reorganize this sum so that one can see what it had to be very simply without adding. Let's look at that now. Here we are going to define what are known as the triangular numbers, and we will denote the nth triangular number by t sub n. We first define t1 to be 1. Then t2 is defined to be 1 plus 2, which is 3. t3 is 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is 6. t4 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 10. t5 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, which is 15. And so on. The general definition of t sub n is that is the sum of the first n natural numbers. We can write this out using the dot notation, or we could write this more formally using summation notation. We would like to find a formula for Tn. How do we proceed? Let us try to represent these sums by pictures. For T1, we just draw one box. Then for T2, let us draw two rows of boxes. The first row has one box, and the second row has two boxes. But of course, the total number of boxes is 1 plus 2, which is 3, which is T2. For T3, we're going to write three rows of boxes. The first row has one box, the second row has two boxes, the third row has three boxes. And we can continue this pattern. And let's follow it up to T5. Now, we can see from these pictures why these are called the triangular numbers. It's because the boxes form a triangle. Now we can make a clever observation. If we make a copy of this triangle and then rotate it and then stick the rotated triangle right next to the original one, then we get a rectangle. How many boxes are in this rectangle? We know that it's the width times the height, and we see the width is given by the bottom row, but since we slid one triangle on top of the other, the height is one more than the number of rows. In the case of T5, we get that the width is 5 and the height is 6. So there are 30 boxes. So 2 times T5 is 30, which gives us that T5 equals 15. But this pattern looks like it holds for all n. So we might conjecture that 2 times the triangular number Tn is exactly n times n minus 1. Or Tn is n times n plus 1 over 2. OK, how do we prove this? So let us review. We have two conjectures so far. For the bouncing ball, we conjecture that the height of the nth bounce is 0.8 to the n times the original height. For triangular numbers, we conjecture that the nth triangular number is n times n plus 1 over 2. Notice that both of these conjectures are in the following form. For all n in the natural numbers, the nth object of some list can be described by some formula that depends on n. So here's the punchline. When we want to prove a statement like that, it is time to bring in the induction. Let us state the principle of induction as the following theorem, which can be written in the following very compact manner. If we know that P1 is true, and whenever P is true for a particular K, it is also true for K plus 1, this gives us that P of N is true for any N in the natural numbers. Another way of saying this, an induction proof has two steps. The first step is the base case, which is to establish that P of 1 is true. The next step is the induction step, which means we assume that P of k is true, and then we show that this implies that P k plus 1 is true. Now, of course, this last step is an implication, and in different contexts, we might prove the induction step directly, or by contradiction, or by the contrapositive, whatever happens to be the most convenient. Okay, let's do some proofs. We want to show that the height after n bounces is 0.8 to the n times the original height. Recall that by definition, we know that each bounce is 80% of the last. So for any k, we have hk plus 1 is 0.8 times hk. First note that h1 is 0.8 times h0 by definition. This establishes the base case. Now assume that hk is 0.8 to the k times h0. Then hk plus 1 
is 0.8 times hk by definition, which plugging in is 0.8 times 0.8 to the k times h0, which doing a little bit of algebra gives us 0.8 to the k plus 1 times h0. Notice that the right-hand side is the formula with n replaced by k plus 1, so we have established the induction step, and the induction proof is done. Let us now revisit the triangular numbers. Our conjecture is that Tn is n times n plus 1 over 2. Recall the definition of Tn. It is the sum of all numbers up to n. Let's first ask, what is the difference between Tn and Tn plus 1? Since Tn plus 1 is the sum of all numbers up to n plus 1, that means that Tn plus 1 is Tn plus n plus 1. This formula is going to be important in our induction proof, so it's useful to do it now. Now let's go. Let's check when n equals 1. We plug in the formula, we get 1 times 2 over 2 is 1, and this matches T1. This checks, so we have established the base case. Now let us assume the formula is correct when n equals k, so that Tk equals k times k plus 1 over 2. Then Tk plus 1 is Tk plus k plus 1 from the formula we established earlier, which by the induction hypothesis is k times k plus 1 over 2 plus k plus 1. Now we put this over a common denominator. Multiply the k plus 1 term by 2 over 2, do a little bit of factorization, and we get that this is k plus 2 times k plus 1 over 2, which is exactly the formula we're trying to prove when n is replaced by k plus 1, and we are done. We've established this formula. Okay, so we've seen a couple of examples, and let's consider the general case here. We consider a scenario where we have some list of objects that depend on n, and we would like to show that some formula f of n applies to these objects. This is the prime case where induction works. Induction tells us that we first check that f of 1 works, the base case, then we assume the formula is correct at level k and deduce it is correct at level k plus 1. But notice that the best best case scenario for induction is whenever our formula has a recursive nature. Recursive means something along these lines. If we could somehow describe the n plus first object in terms of the nth object, this is known as a recursive relationship. Notice in the previous two cases, in one case that came naturally from the definition, in the second case we actually manufactured that formula because we knew it would be useful. And it should be clear at this point that having such a recursive relationship lends itself very well to a proof by induction. I'll let Vince McMahon summarize all of this in his own unique manner. And I guess we'll end there.